Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CASAS. My name is Andrew, and we're so excited that you're here with us today. Now, our mission is simple. We want to lead spiritually disconnected people into a life-giving relationship with God. You know, one of the things we love about the 10 Minute Party is it's a chance for us to get to know and connect with people that are new here. Anytime I've been somewhere new, it really takes me a while before I'm willing to jump in and take that next step. So I understand what it can be like, especially at a big place. When we first started, we had it about every six weeks, and we just thought, you know, there's gonna be some new people, and we'd love to just connect with them and meet them. And that started filling up, and the next thing you know, we start doing it once a month, and then every other week. And I remember a discussion when we talked about, let's go every single week. And I just thought for sure, you know, there's not gonna be that many people. But now, we have a 10-minute party every single week, and there are lots and lots of people that come back. I love it when there are new people that get to meet other new people and kind of make this connection or people that have been at the church for a long time and just getting to make that connection with someone who's experiencing this for the very first time is just exciting. I love to just meet new people, especially because we get people that come back from all different walks of life um, and church experiences and some have questions, some just want to learn a little bit more about what we do here at, at the church. It's also really cool to see the leadership of our church just interact with people on a personal level. We really just desire this 10 minute party environment to be something really comfortable for you to come back to, just say hi and that can be it and we hope that you come and feel welcome and are really at ease here with us. I will absolutely be back there at the 10 minute party and we'd love to have you. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Doing good? Good. Uh, well, my name is Andy. It's great to have you all here this morning. If you're a guest with us here today, we're so glad that you came. And actually, you'll notice in the uh, handout that you received is a blue card. If this is your first or second time here, could you take that blue card and fill it out? And then a little bit later in the service, when the offering plate comes by, just feel free to throw that uh, right in there. And that's our chance to kind of connect with you. That'd be great. Well, I thought today would be a great day to just start off with some scripture that kind of speaks to uh, kind of the heart of our church and ultimately why we worship. And so this uh, scripture comes from uh, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, uh, verse 15. And it says, And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Is that amazing? Just a great, great thought and the reason that we ultimately come together uh, to sing as a community. So why don't you stand up, turn to the people around you and say hi this morning. Love, 
Father God, you reign over all things. You were before all things. And God, you stand at the end of time. You've created all things. And you will reign forever. Father, here in this place today, we stand as a group of people, a community, Lord, lifting up the name of Jesus. And it's the reason we're here, that for all time, we will sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive riches and honor and glory, goodness forever. The God you created a way through Jesus for each and every one of us. And we worship today at the foot of the cross. Lord, we could do none of this ourselves, but we rely wholly on you, Father. We can't understand. Your righteousness is unthinkable. Your holiness is incomprehensible. And God, we want more of you today, here, now. And we'll say forever, Jesus. 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 We love you. We honor you. We glorify you today. In Jesus' name. Amen.
stand in awe of your name, Lord.
Father, you are so many things to us, Lord. You're the, you're the rock we can stand on, Father. You're our comforter, the one we can run to, the one who loves us. So many things, God. You fill so many needs in us, Lord, and we just thank you for that. We lift you up. We exalt you. God, be blessed in what we bring to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. back there and uh, it's amazing because all of your voices are directed up here and it's beautiful to hear you sing. Uh, I just want to say that it has nothing to do with the sermon or talk or anything today. It literally is though it's beautiful to hear you sing. Thank you for, for lifting your voice. It's amazing and it's fun to be a part of it. Today I, I want to start by sharing a story. It was two Two Christmases ago, really, that my, my wife and I, we decided we were going to attend an event here in Tucson that occurs every Christmas, I believe, now, and it's called Zoo Lights. Has anyone ever been to Zoo Lights? Taking the family, done that thing? Yes. Good. Uh, we had never been before, and so I, I heard that uh, essentially the Reed Park Zoo turns into Winter Haven, but at the zoo, where they, they decorate with Christmas lights and ornaments, and they have... Uh, you know, music and food and kind of like little booths and stuff. And so we, you know, decided that'd be really fun to take our kids to. And at the time, it was just my daughter to take my daughter to. And so we went. And I walked into this place, into the Reed Park Zoo, and it was swarming with people. In fact, it was a little crazy. Uh, my, my wife, you know, bought this giant stroller that I, I just call a freight train. It's like, drives me insane because it's so big that everyone else just needs to clear out of the way. Like, I just feel like I need to walk around yelling unclean or something. So everybody just, you know, parts the seas. And, and so I, I felt much like I did because this night was so busy. Uh, like, you know, if you've wandered into Costco on a Saturday on accident, like you're going to be stuck there today. There's people still walking around in Costco right now uh, from yesterday. It's crazy. And so we, we're making our way through this place, you know, looking at everything. And my daughter's so excited. She's running from thing to thing, having a great time. And we finally come to the very last, uh, you know, exhibit that we'll look at. And it's the lion enclosure. And, and so she's, you know, we walk up to it. And the, the zoo has this thing. It's like a cave type deal that you walk in. And then there's the, the glass that's right in front of you. And and the lion is inside of its enclosure. It's dark, but it's pacing like something's wrong with it, like it's angry or something, like it's got a level of intensity to it. And I don't know if it was because of just all of the noise. There was a lot of people there making a lot of noise. They had live music. I don't know if it was because of the lights, the constant you know, intrusiveness, whatever this was. But that lion is just pacing back and forth, which was awesome. And so we push ourselves. You know, We're right there up by the glass. And my daughter has you know, got her hands on the glass and is just looking at this thing. When all of a sudden, the lion stops. And it looks at my daughter. And it crouches down. And it lunges and jumps forward to attack her. There's glass. But none of us thought about that at the moment. Like, everyone screamed. And what we saw was a lion's face, mouth wide open, hit the glass, paws in the air, like jump through the air, paws hit the glass, and its body followed, and then it kind of fell off, slunk over, and continued pacing. Everyone screamed. It was terrifying. And the reason why is for maybe a fleeting moment. Well, one, it's just startling, but for a fleeting moment, it's like you forget that there's even glass there. It's like for just a moment you forget that this is all okay, we're at a zoo and this is going to be fine and you just see this lion jumping forward and you realize it's insane. That's why everyone screamed. And then I look down at my daughter and I'm waiting for the traumatic moment to unfold. You know, we can never go to the zoo again and she hates lions and you can't say the word lion or she starts crying, that kind of thing. And I look at her and pick her up and she, she you know, looks at me and she goes, he scared me. <laughs> and I said... Yeah, he scared all of us. And then my favorite line that she said in this whole experience, she looks at me and goes, yeah, that lion wanted to be my friend. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You look at that, that lion, like, this lion just tried to attack her. She witnesses the whole experience, stands there, everyone else screams and all this stuff, and my daughter is just like, yeah, he wants to be my friend. Like, isn't the perspective of a child, like, marvelous? <laughs> It's amazing that somebody, that, that she could go through that experience, that, and that is what she says, this lion wants to be my friend. I, I love the perspective that, that children often see the world through, 
But we don't stay with that perspective, do we? Because we grow up. And eventually, the way you describe that encounter changes. You begin as an adult to see the world maybe with more of its complexity and more of what's really happening there. And suddenly, you encounter something like this. And my perspective of the entire thing was, was not that this was a lion who just wanted to be friends. It was not that, you know, hey, that's like the talking animal from the Disney Channel. It was not that's a cute and cuddly creature. That thing is a wild lion, and it wants to devour you. Praise God for glass. That's my perspective in that moment. And it's just funny how you don't keep that childlike perspective forever. Eventually, it's, well, it's just more complicated, isn't it? Eventually you see more than just what meets the eye and you experience things differently. And do you know the same thing is true with scripture? If I were to ask you, you know, let's take a random survey and say, what, what story within all of the Bible do you think is probably the greatest children's story? There are very good odds that, you know, the collective, collective representation of your votes would come out as this, Noah and the ark, which is today's passage. You'd say, yeah, Noah and the ark, and there's, there's reasons for it. That, that story has a lot of things that make for great children's stories. There's the God of the universe who loves this righteous man named Noah, and he, he protects him and tells him to build an ark, and the ark is beyond your wildest imagination. The thing is huge. It's giant. And on that ark is going to be a pair of every living creature that walks upon the earth and flies in the air. They're all coming to this. It's going to house them. And then, you know, God's going to send the rains and it's going to flood and everyone's safe upon the ark. And the story ends with a dove and a rainbow. And it's great. It's this nice, neat little packaged children's story. It's the one I grew up hearing and it's what I've told my daughters. But then you get a little older and you find yourself looking at that story and you're like, yeah, but everyone drowned. Weird, isn't it? And then you start to think about the ark. That's not a luxury cruise liner. They weren't all having a ball in there. They're surviving a flood. And as though, as though just being stuck uh, you know, on this giant ark out at sea, you know, yearning for land wouldn't have gotten to you enough. Even further than that, there, every animal in existence is on this thing. If the noise and the chaos and the seasickness didn't get to you, the smell certainly would have. I don't care how many windows you put on this ark, it would have been wretched. It would have been like the end of you over time, just a slow wearing on your psyche. The story's weird. It really is, if you see it from an adult perspective. And yet, I kind of wonder if oftentimes we miss it. And so let's look at this. Let's look at it in a way that allows for the complexity of all of it. And let's try to make sense of this passage this morning. And ultimately, we're going to continue forward in this series called Misguided Men. And what I want to point to is a moment in human history where absolutely everything went wrong where absolutely everything went wrong, and God does something about it. And as we kind of journey through this grand story that is Noah's Ark, there's really two things, if you miss everything else, that I hope you walk away with. And one is this, your life is bigger than you think. Your life is far bigger than you think. And number two, there is a God who is all about the rescue. There is, there's a God who's all about the rescue. And I think at the end of the day, you're gonna discover that Noah's Ark isn't just a story, it's about changing your life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter six. And uh, let me give you a little background on this moment as you kind of turn there, just hang out for a moment. I wanna walk you through the creation narrative up to this point. And you know, I know we've been covering it and a lot of us have heard it, but humor me for just a moment. God creates the entire known world. He creates mankind, he creates all the animals, the plants, everything in existence, and he looks at it all, man's relationship within it, and he says, it is good, it is complete, it is full and perfect, it's great. And at some point in time, you know, man has this perfect relationship with God. He's centered on and who God is. It's, it's this direct connection, so to speak. Man becomes discontented, yearns for something else, and at some point in time, we choose other. And we break that relationship with God. We violate it, so to speak. And suddenly, where there was once intimacy, there's now separation. Where there was once this personal notion of God and man, there's now separation between the two. And, and, the, and brokenness enters the world. And you know this because vocabulary suddenly enters the narrative in the book of Genesis that didn't exist there before. In Genesis chapter 3, we suddenly hear words like this, and they felt ashamed. Can you imagine? They didn't even have a word for that. 
They didn't even know what that feeling was. It hadn't existed to this point, and suddenly brokenness enters, and you have vocabulary like shame that's there. Then you get to Genesis chapter 4, which is what uh, Glenn talked about last week, where two brothers essentially go to give sacrifice. They're trying to, to reach out and connect with God, more or less. One gives of, ultimately, his heart gives of himself. The other one kind of meets the least common denominator as far as an offering to God is concerned. God smiles upon one. He looks down upon the other. And the, the brother whose offering wasn't acceptable is filled with such scorn and ultimately hatred that he murders his brother. Think about this. This is just four chapters in from the, from the creation of it all. Isn't it funny how brokenness compounds? Do you notice that? That our brokenness, as we live out of it, we tend to affect the people around us in ways that fosters their brokenness, and we create more and more problems, and it grows and it grows, and it just keeps spiraling, and this sort of thing just happens. Well, as you go from Genesis chapter 4 and you move forward, that's how life continues to work. And eventually, the world gets to a certain spot where God looks at it, he observes the landscape, and he makes a very bold statement about just what is, and then he makes a declaration about what he's going to do. And so, Genesis chapter 6, starting at verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God surveys the landscape and essentially says it's all evil. That all that's happening, all that's happening is wickedness. All that's happening is evil and it's playing itself out around him. It's like the brokenness is compounding. It's growing. This is existence. This is life. God declares it. And then verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And essentially what you're getting from this passage, God surveys the landscape. He sees basically this is the environment. This is the way it looks. And humanity is kind of spun out of control as far as this goes. There's none who seek for good. There's nothing here that, that ultimately is, is good. It's all just kind of evil and brokenness playing itself out all over the place. And, and what God is doing in the Hebrew language that's used in, in verses especially 7 and 8 as it kind of moves forward is this, it's like God is looking at it all and he says, I made this, I'm responsible for it, and I'm gonna do something about it. It's like this cause and reaction thing as God looks out, surveys it all, and says, okay, something must be done, and God decides that he's going to flood the earth. You know, we've heard the story. And so, there's one exception. There's a man named Noah, and, and it says God had favor upon Noah. And we know that Noah was a righteous man, and so God looks at Noah and his family, this kind of righteous symbol, uh, you know, this family here that, that ultimately God says, Noah, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to protect you. I want you to go, and I want you to build a boat. It's a really big boat. It's called an ark, and it's going to blow your mind because this thing's like football fields. And not only are you going to build this, which probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but ultimately every animal is going to come to this ark. They're going to get on the thing, and one one day I'm going to flood, I'm going to send the waters, I'm going to send the rains, the flood is going to come, and you and your family and all the animals within the ark will be spared, and that's what's going to happen, and so Noah begins to build the ark, and God floods the earth, and, and so I know I'm paraphrasing a lot, this is four chapters long, and we've got a place to get to, but so God floods the earth, and Noah's floating, you know, with his family upon the ark, and lest we, at this moment in time, begin to see this story, as a lion who simply wants to be our friend, I want to read chapter 7, starting at verse 21 with you. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds and livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils were the breath of life died. And he blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Here's the paraphrase. If you weren't on the ark, you drowned. Everyone dies. It's a sobering moment, isn't it? You know, when we tell this story, we gloss over this part. We are like, yeah, and then everyone, you know, he took care of that, but Noah saved and all this other stuff. Rainbow, we're getting to a rainbow. And we often skip over this spot right here where, where literally all of humanity that isn't on the ark drowns. They perish. And, and it's, I, I understand why we skip it. It doesn't make for a very good children's book, does it? It'd be some pretty gruesome illustrations if you were to walk that out. and No one would show that to their kids. It'd be weird. 
So I get why we skip it, but I don't want us to this morning. I want us to actually just sit on this for a moment. I want us to understand and feel the weight of the impact that happened right there. And the reason why is because ultimately I think God understands our hearts. And I think God understands our, our mind, the way we think about things, the way we approach this life. And ultimately at this moment in time in the grand story that is Noah in the ark, I think God is speaking to a question that every human being for all time asks and has asked. And it's this, why doesn't God just erase evil in the first place? Everyone asks that. You don't have to be a believer in God to ask that. Just by pondering the very notion that there might be a God who exists out there and this earth exists the way it does, everyone asks, well, why would this thing happen? Why does God not just do away with evil in the first place? I thought it was good. You know, one of the number one things in, in any conversation that I have with a person who's Christian or not as we begin to talk about God and just existence of God is this. People always look at me and say, what about Hitler, right? What about a Holocaust? Where's God in that? Why would God allow a man like Hitler to exist? Why didn't God just erase Hitler from the face of the earth instead of these horrible atrocities? And sure, when you look at genocide and you look at some of these different things that have occurred over time, there's, it, the, the impact of evil is so large and so grand that we all find ourselves saying, why? You know, why would that even happen? Why didn't God remove him from the first place? Well, that's broad, but sometimes it gets personal. You know, there's some of you in here that you haven't just walked through something hard. You have survived it. There's some of you in here that have been impacted by just other people in such a way that I marvel that you've made it. It's an act of grace that you're here. And you look at some of those situations, and if you're really honest, there are moments in your life where you say, why didn't God just remove that person, that thing, to begin with? I was driving in a car with a good friend a long time ago, and we had a moment of honest conversation, and he was talking with me about how he had been sexually abused a few years earlier. And it was by a guy, and it was by somebody that, that ultimately was responsible, was supposed to care for him, was supposed to train him and teach him and some different things, and it was within an organization that was supposed to foster his livelihood and, and, and you know, his, and him as a, as a youth person and, and all this stuff. And it was terrible, and he's sitting amidst all of his brokenness, and he's talking about his peers because he wasn't alone. There were several people that, that had the same moment happen to them, and some of their lives were like breaking apart at the seams and kind of spinning out of control, and, and he looks at all of this, and he just, he looked at me, and he goes, I just don't understand why, why God didn't just erase him. And in that moment, I didn't answer because I don't honestly think he was looking for an answer. He was a hurting person that just wanted to be recognized, and so I did. But I can answer now. See, I'd point you back to Genesis 6 through 10, and I'd tell you, God did. You say, why doesn't God just wipe out evil? Why doesn't he just do away with it all? He did. He did. He flooded the earth. He looked out. He surveyed the landscape. It was all evil. It was all bad. There was one righteous man in his family named Noah, and he flooded the whole thing. He started over. It was as though God said, take two, creation 2.0. Here it is. He started it over. And the reason I don't want you to gloss over the fact that that actually happened is because of this. It answers a question that every single one of us asks at various times in our life, and, and people around us continue to ask. And it's that idea, why didn't God just erase evil? He did. And what we came to realize is that evil wasn't the problem, it was us. Because you know what happens immediately after the story of Noah and the ark? You have a moment where a son deeply shames his father and a curse is given. Four chapters later, chapter 14, you have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities of unprecedented evil that, that ultimately it, you know, God speaks to and judges in that moment, and you look at it, that's four chapters after Noah and the ark. And it illustrates an issue that just by wiping evil out, wiping evil clean, when we ask God to do that, when we say that's what we want, what we really mean in that moment is that, God, when are you going to exterminate humanity? Because you can't just deal with the problem of evil. You ultimately have to deal with us. And so what the flood, what that moment, what the start over points to is that God, from then to that point forward, will enter in and deal with us. It's exactly what he does, meets us where we are at in this place. And instead of dealing with evil, he deals with humanity. And there's this beautiful instance. If you have, uh, again, your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 9. 
And I want you to imagine something before we read this passage. And the thing that I want you to imagine is this, that you have been on this ark, that you're with Noah, that you're, you know, you're part of his family or however this works. You've experienced this whole deal. And suddenly you find the ark resting upon dry land. The flood subsides. The, the survival is over as far as that moment goes. And the doors open up and you and all your family, you begin to pour out of this thing. And for the first time you experience that longing once again, realized upon dry land and you're good. And all the animals come out with you and you look and you, you don't, you're not greeted by a world that you have to fit into. You're greeted by a world with virtually no parameters. It's the brave new world. It's creation 2.0 started over. And as you step out of the ark, it's essentially laid out before you brand new. And it's just you and your relatives and all of these animals uh, that, that are essentially getting to ask the question, what do I do with life now? I get to start fresh. How many of us have longed for that moment? Or you get to start over as though there were no encumbrances on this earth and you just got to ask the question completely raw and just right there, who does God want me to be? What is this life supposed to look like? And you step out into the brave new world and as they do, God begins to speak. God begins to speak. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, this should remind you of something, doesn't it? Because he's quoting straight back from the beginning of Genesis with Adam and Eve. When, when God essentially presented the garden to Adam and said, This is yours. It's all here. Go live in it. Dwell in it. Live to the fullest of that which I've created you to be. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill it. This is what he tells him. And so immediately we're reminded back of that situation. And what it tells us is that for all of Noah and his descendants and everybody that stands there, it's like God is pointing out to the new creation. And he's saying, take two. Be fruitful and multiply. Go. And ultimately from this point forward, God is going to point all of Noah and his, and his descendants, but ultimately us, because we live in this creation, don't we? Because we live in this reality. Because we exist post-flood. We exist in creation 2.0. He speaks to three relationships that ultimately he has created every human being to experience and to have in the fullness of what life in this place should be. And the first one is this. We were created to have a relationship with creation itself. Verse 2, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Again, isn't it reminiscent of the garden with Adam? You hear that, and it's, it's again, it's back to creation. God, God looks at Noah, and he says, this is all yours, and, and I give you power, and I give you dominion. You, you have that over all of creation, the plants on the ground, the animals with it. It is yours. Now, don't get me wrong. If we were to just read these two verses, verse in two, verses 2 and 3, it'd be really easy for us to just say this. God gives us dominion, and he gives us power over creation, and so we can do whatever we want. You know, we, we're over it. We can do whatever we want. But to do that and to say that is ultimately missing something very important entirely. And I think a, a quote that will be fitting in this case as we talk about mankind was meant to have a relationship with the creation itself is from Spider-Man. The character Peter Parker, you know, the place he is Spider-Man, and his uncle goes to him and he says, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. It's a quote from somewhere else, but it's made popular by Spider-Man. And that is true here. That you have dominion and you have power over creation, but don't miss this. With great power comes great responsibility. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Let me, let me illustrate. I want you to ponder something for a moment. I want you to think about this. Why did God flood the animal kingdom? I mean, don't get me wrong, we have an answer for why God flooded humanity. We get that, okay? So there was wickedness upon the earth, humanity was wicked, and the intentions of their heart, all of it was just kind of going south, and so God starts over with a righteous man. We get that. But at the same time, it says that God also flooded. He took the life of every living creature that walked upon the ground and flew with upon, like, in the air. Why did God do that? Had they sinned? Had the creation sinned? Did it committed some horrible atrocity? Was it evil? No. 
No, in fact, creation itself lives innately out of that which God has created it to be. That, that's who it is. That, that's how it is. Involuntarily, it is living in such a way just as God created it. Creation has not sinned. There wasn't, creation wasn't evil. God had made it, and he looked out, and he saw that it was good. So ask yourself this question. Why did God essentially exterminate the animal kingdom and start over with those who were in the ark? And the answer is profound, and it's found in the very first passage that we read today in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God looked out upon the world and he said, the wickedness of man has grown to a spot that every intention of their hearts is evil. And so here is what I will do. I will blot out man and I will blot out the animal kingdom. And here's what that tells us. The reason the animals were flooded was not because of the animals themselves, but because of mankind the wickedness and the evil of mankind. And what that points to, what that ultimately tells us, is that our choices, that our lives, that even the evil and the good, all of the stuff within us has bearing upon the existence of creation itself. And I'm not just speaking physically, but also spiritually. And it illustrates a point. One, you were created to have relationship with creation, but ultimately this, your life is far bigger than you think. Because your choices and your interactions, they have bearing upon the actual creation itself. And when you think like that, and when you understand that God, does, God experiences the flood, puts it out there and says, never will I do this again, what it points to with us who live now is that we are to protect and to foster and to care for the creation around us. You have a responsibility because your life has bearing upon it, both physically and spiritually. Dominion isn't about just doing what you want. Dominion comes with great responsibility. And so I just want to ask you, do you experience that relationship with the creation around you? And this is not me saying, go out and save Mother Earth. This is not me saying, go out and, and fight for creation because of a, it's an entity in and of itself. All of creation proclaims the glory of God. All throughout the Psalms, it's just evident again and again and again about how God's glory just emanates and shines from creation itself. In Romans, it just talks about how everything is proclaiming his glory, and it can be seen. It's like this visible display all around us. We don't protect Mother Earth. No, what we contend for, what we exercise our dominion and power, over is to enter into that moment so that it continues to shine, so that it continues to be proclaimed, to proclaim the great goodness and the glory of God, so that all might look upon it who desperately need to see that beautiful, grace-filled creator and recognize it. And so we foster it, we protect it. Your life is far bigger than yourself. But there's also a second relationship that God calls us to. And it's this, mankind was created to have a relationship with humanity. We were all created to have a relationship with humanity. This is God's desire for our life. And here's what I mean by that. Let's continue to read chapter 9, starting at verse 4. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And what it's saying here is don't eat a living thing. I mean, don't see something alive and just start gnawing on its back, because that's weird. Verse 5, what it's really getting to, what it's pointing to, is, is coming up here. And for your life blood, meaning for your very life itself, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require reckoning for the life of man. And what God is speaking to here is simply this. Life is precious, and, and, and specifically human life. God is saying that human life is, is deeply valuable, that it has this innate value to it. It is absolutely and utterly precious to him. And God is declaring he will protect it. He will require a reckoning for it. So much so that he says, I'll require a reckoning if a man takes a life, and I'll require a reckoning if an animal takes a life. Which means if that tiger had succeeded and eat my daughter, God would have been really upset. Which makes me comforted. But I don't understand why, because he's just living out of who he is. And I think the point of this is, don't take this too far, it's just this. God is declaring that human life is so valuable that in every facet of our lives, in all of life, he will care for it, protect it, and value it. It is priceless. And you say, well, why? And you read the next verse, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Why is it so valuable? Why is it so precious? Because every human being, everywhere, for all time, is an image bearer made in the very image of the most high God. And what I love about this is that that means that everyone has innate value. 
that, that Christians ultimately, remember I, I said, your life is bigger than you think. You were created to have a relationship with humanity. That ultimately, when you grasp this, that everyone, everyone is made in the image of God, then you realize that as believers, as followers of this God, we are to love indiscriminately. Because everyone is an image bearer. Because everyone shines with the glory and beauty and the value, the intrinsic value of what God has placed within them. And so here is what this means for us. That we're to care for it. That we're to protect it just as God does. That we're to seek its well-being when you're, if you're in Tucson, Arizona, and, and you suddenly open your eyes to the fact that here in our very city, that, that there are people every single week who are, go literally without nourishment and sustenance to the point that their vitality is actually diminishing, you can't look at this any longer and say, that's their problem. No, it's not. It's our problem because we were created to have a relationship with humanity in which human life is valuable and precious. What you can't do, and this is, is a growing awareness for me because there was an arrest in my neighborhood, what you can't do is suddenly open your eyes to the fact that sex trafficking and human slavery is on the rise here in Tucson, and, and, and in Phoenix especially, in places, and it's a growing problem. Look at that, become aware of it, realize these people are, are detained, and their life is actually diminishing, their very vitality diminishing in such a way. You can't just look at this and say, oh, that's their problem, it's not mine. No, it's not. It is yours. It is ours. It is all of our problem because we were created to have a relationship with humanity defined by the intrinsic value you that is human life and further here's what that means that love truly is indiscriminate that whether Christian or atheist Muslim or Jewish Hindu or Mormon or whatever faith system exists out there whether it's a person that you like or dislike whether they have merited help or not merited whatever this is whether you think that, that your opinion of them is less or high whether they are a legal citizen of this country or an illegal immigrant whether they have made choices that, that you know should be punished whatever these things are it means that we love indiscriminately because it is regardless of condition here in this moment it is regardless of what has been done or what our perception of what is actually is, what it's pointed to is that every human being indiscriminately is an image bearer with their life that has innate value and that we as followers of God are called to foster life and to be protectors of it. Your life is far bigger than you think. You were created to have a relationship with humanity. And lastly, one last relationship, and really if I'm honest, I wanted to take this one and put it at the beginning because the truth of the matter is this is the most important and if, if you get this next one, then, then you really, all the, us, all the other stuff just kind of fall under it. If you, if you grasp this thing, then everything else starts to work out. It's the first, you have to have it. It's this, all of humanity. God wants us to have a relationship with himself. God wants us to have a relationship with himself. Go back to that moment I asked you to imagine yourself in at the ark. You stand upon dry land and you enter into the brave new world before you and, and just all of the hope and all of just the, the peace that would have existed in that moment and the excitement. And as God begins to speak, there in the backdrop, there in the backdrop of it all is a rainbow. Chapter 9, continuing to read it, verse 8, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. God declares, this is my promise to you and all of creation with you. Verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Verse 13, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. 
And I love this moment. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the rainbow. This is the reason we tell this story to kids and think it's so amazing. And God looks at all of humanity and all of creation and says, I never, never again will I flood the earth again. And as they stand with the backdrop of the rainbow, it's supposed to be this promise there that reminds them of this truth. But there's a reality to this, perhaps because of maybe the story we were told as kids, or perhaps because we grew up reading the NIV translation. And the NIV is a great translation. As amazing scholarship, you should read it. It's fantastic. But it misses something here. And the reason why is it actually uses the word rainbow. And the reality is, the rainbow didn't exist. In the Hebrew, at this moment, the word for rainbow didn't exist. In fact, that's not the word that's used. The Hebrew word that is used here in this passage at this time is the word for war bow, like a bow and arrow or hunting bow. It was a bow designed to inflict damage, a a bow intent on killing something. That's what it was. And so think of the shape of a rainbow. It's in the shape of a bow. And so verse 13 suddenly takes on a whole new set of power. When God says to all of humanity and all of creation, I have hung my bow in the clouds, what he is declaring is I am no longer at war with you. I am not at war with you. I have hung my bow in the clouds. It rests upon the mantle. I am done with it. I am leaving it alone. I am not at war with you. Never again will I flood the earth in this matter. Never again will I operate with humanity in this way. I am not at war with you. And this is so significant because there are people in this room that are like me. And here's what I mean by that. Growing up, I made a lot of stupid choices and different stuff because I'm impulsive and just all kinds of crazy reasons. And and there were times in life where I I just felt like my relationship with God, I actually had fear of him. And I don't mean fears and reverence, and I don't mean fears in the kind of like awe and respect that comes with the God of the universe. I mean, I was waiting for the flood. I mean, I was waiting for the lightning bolt. Like there's this impending judgment that's about to crash down on my life because of the things that I've done that I can't overcome. And there are some of you who sit in this room, and that's what you're standing under. And you want to know God. Some of you don't, like, you you don't even know if you believe in God, but you want to. But how could there be any room in the house of God for you? How could there be any room in the kingdom for you? And what you walk around with is all of these things that you're trying to overcome and get rid of, and it's like this weight upon you, and it's like God is at war with you. And I just want to stand and say, he's hung his bow in the clouds. The war is over. And God declares our rescue. And so if you are pinned beneath that weight, can I just challenge you this morning to experience rescue? God's not at war with you. He wants to rescue you. Two chapters later, we get to Abraham. God encounters him and ultimately makes a covenant with him where he says, you will be blessed to be a blessing, meaning this, one day through you, through all the nations will be blessed. One day Jesus is coming. I'm not standing back, flooding the earth. I'm entering into the mix. I'm not just dealing with evil. I'm dealing with people. I'm dealing with you. And I'm going to change you from the inside out. And one day, the Savior is going to come who's going to change it all. The war is over. The rescue has begun. God's not at war with you. His bow is hung in the clouds. So I ask you today, will you allow yourself to be rescued? Will you you stop looking for a fighter plane and see the rescue plane? Will you allow yourself to approach the God of the universe and just be lavish in the fullness of grace that is Christ Jesus and allow yourself to be rescued? And here's why. You were created to have relationship with God. It's the missing piece that continues to foster the brokenness around us, within us, or like all of it. And, And furthermore, if you do allow yourself to be rescued, if you do step into that moment where you just bask in the fullness of a God who has hung up his war bow and you become the rescued, I want you to understand once again, that your life is bigger than you ever thought because you have a relationship with humanity and you have a relationship with the creation and you have become a rescuer. That is the life that God has called us to. This is creation 2.0. This is the brave new world. So go and live and dwell in the fullness that proclaims who he is. He is not at war with us. He is our rescuer. Maybe, maybe the truth is that we do ourselves a little bit of disservice when we share 
the cookie cutter version of this story with our kids. Maybe there's a lot more that they need to see and grasp within this. But at the very same time, maybe there's a part of us that miss what they see. And we've become so preoccupied with seeing a roaring lion that we've missed the fact that there before us stands a lion who simply wants to be our friend. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I just thank you, God. I thank you that you are all about the rescue. I thank you that your war bow is hung in the clouds. I thank you that there is life and breath in Jesus, God. I thank you for the dominion and power that you placed over us in creation, God, but I also, Lord, just open our eyes to the responsibility of it and how we can foster it and contend for it, Lord. And God, open our eyes to just humanity around us. Help us to see them as you do, Lord, to just see intrinsic beauty for their image bearers all around us, Lord, and just lay before us opportunities to step in and to love them and to guard and value life itself indiscriminately, Father. Help us to choose you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You know what I love about what Ryan did was he took a story that oftentimes just seems like a Bible story for kids and brought some depth to what God was really trying to show and tell through that story. And I hope that this week it gives you a moments to ponder and reflect on your own relationship with God, uh, wherever that is. And I'm sure that there are some of you that are here this morning and maybe you're here for the very first time or maybe it's just the second time. And uh, on behalf of our entire church, I wanna just say welcome. And it is a pleasure uh, to have you here and hope that this was a meaningful moment and time for you as you got to just uh, worship and be with us here this morning. And uh, there's something that uh, we ask all of our first and second time guests uh, to do. And if if that's you, if you would do this, Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, There was a blue card that was in the handout you were given when you came in. We'd love it if you just uh, fill that out and circle whether or not you're a first or second time uh, guest on there. Uh, Ryan would love to just send you a card this week to just encourage you and uh, give you a small gift just uh, for being here. And uh, if there's something that we can be praying for in your life, uh, we'd invite you to write it down on this card when you turn it in a little while. Or we always have people in our prayer ministry room over here, some uh, elders and leaders within our church that would love to just take a moment to pray for you. If there's something that that you would love to have someone pray for you uh, before you leave here this morning. We're going to take a moment and give God his gifts. And so I'm going to ask the ushers if you'd go ahead and move into place. And I'll just say that, you know, This moment where we give our gifts to God, this is a moment to tithe. That is a moment to respond to the God that we love. It's a moment to further what this church is about. And so if you want to participate in this, I would invite you to do so. And I'm going to just pray for our offering uh, here this morning. So would you just bow your heads for a quick prayer? Father, we just thank you for this moment to reflect on your word. And God, we give you these gifts as an act of worship here this morning. We pray this in your son's name, amen. Uh, You know, one of the things that we believe in here at Casas very deeply is community, relationships. You know, that relates to what Ryan was saying in his message here a little while ago, that one of the things that God has created us to be and to respond in is with with fellow human beings in relationships. And we see good things happen through relationships in this Uh, church. And if you're here this morning and you're saying, you know, I've been a part of this church for a little while and I'm ready to maybe take that next step and get to meet some more people or build some deeper relationships, we have an event for you coming up August 11th. Uh, It's going to be our ABF community hallway party. And the reason we call it that is in our education building, we've got a couple of wide, long hallways. And on August 11th throughout the morning, we're going to throw a semi-ruckus of a party uh, over there. For anyone and everyone who would like to explore our ABFs, and so I want to invite you to uh, go over there. You'll have a chance to meet the leaders within our ABF communities. 
You'll get to meet people that are a part of them, and you will get to meet other people that are right where you are, that are saying, I want to I want to go a little deeper in this church. I want to meet some people or become more connected. So August 11th is uh, the date for you if you want to do that. Then lastly, uh, I just want to say to all of you who are first-time guests here this morning, we would love to give you this gift, a book, uh, not this exact book, but we've got other copies of this book that we'd love to give you. Uh, it's one of my favorite books, phenomenal author, Tim Keller, and we love to give this book out to first-time guests, and one of the main reasons we do that is this book captures the heart and soul of who we are as a church. And so if you're a first-time guest, this is one of the best books you could read. It's a great book. And so if you want a copy of it, just come right on back to uh, the 10-minute party, which is right back here, right after this service. And we could, would love to give you a copy of that in the 10-minute party. Uh, any of you who are new to Casas would love to have an opportunity to meet one of our pastors. Ryan will be back there. I will be back there. Uh, Andy and many of our other pastors will be, will be back there. And we would love to just shake your hand and say hi and welcome you to Casas. Why don't you stand and uh, let me just close out our morning with a blessing here. May God keep you and shine his face upon you and your life, and your family, and may you dwell in his presence. Amen. Amen. You have a great morning, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.